and we thank you all for tuning in. In these, let's call them interesting times, we're grateful for the opportunity to invite virtual audiences to come together in dialogue, even when we're not exactly, you know, coming together. So I'd especially like to thank Secretary Gates and General Chiarelli for helping us keep ideas and community aloft here at Town Hall. The presentation this evening will likely run around 30 minutes, followed by audience Q&A. You can view the event on Crowdcast, Facebook, or YouTube. And to participate in the Q&A, though, you will need to submit directly using the Ask a Question button on Crowdcast. Try to keep it succinct so we can get to as many as possible. For closed captioning, uh, YouTube is your best bet. You can enable real-time captions by clicking the CC button in the bottom right-hand corner. Town Hall adds new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming programs include Sandra Singh Low with Melanie Mayron on the indignities of middle age, which as I read that as a subject about which I frankly require no further insight. At any rate, Obama's writer David Litt in conversation with Jim Obergefell. Uh, let's see, as well as two more of our Sterling Jazz concerts live from our forum space, co-produced with Earshot Jazz, including next Saturday's tribute to Thelonious Monk. Also, since you've by now certainly exhausted your children's Disney Plus membership, make sure you visit Town Hall's media library for hundreds of events from the recent and pre-COVID past. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Civics programming in particular is supported by the Real Networks Foundation, the True Brown Foundation, KUOW, and the Wincote Foundation Northwest. But as most of you know, Town Hall is a member-based organization and we wanna thank all of our members watching tonight. On that note, Town Hall, like nonprofits generally, has been hit hard by the economic impacts of the pandemic. We made tonight's event free to maximize access, but we hope you will consider a donation this evening by clicking on the button at the bottom of Crowdcast or by using the URLs on the other platforms or by becoming a member. Uh, they tell me you can also text the words Town Hall to the number 44321 and it will turn your humble smartphone into a kind of a donation robot, but I have not tried that. On a related note, since you're likely wanting to learn more about tonight's topic, and let's be honest, if we were gathered together in the Great Hall, many of you would visit the book signing table tonight to thank uh, Dr. Gates for his service. Please use the link on this live stream page to purchase directly through our terrific partners at the LA Bay Book Company. Buy the book, and just as important, buy a local, and just maybe some of the things we loved about life pre-epidemic might survive this strange time. All right. Dr. Robert M. Gates served as the U.S. Secretary of Defense from December 2006 to July 2011. He was the only Secretary of Defense in U.S. history to be asked to remain in that office by a newly elected <clears> president. <throat> Perhaps more notably, uh, President Obama was the eighth president Dr. Gates served in some capacity. Before becoming Secretary of Defense, he was the president of Texas A&M University, the nation's seventh largest. And prior to assuming that role, on August 1st, 2002, he was the interim dean of, the univer of that university's George Bush School of Government and Public Service. Secretary Gates joined the CIA in 1966 and spent nearly 27 years as an intelligence professional, including nine years at the National Security Council uh, and the White House. Gates has been awarded the National Security Medal, the President Presidential Citizens Medal, among many other awards for service. And since leaving public life, <clears throat> excuse me, He's been president of the Boy Scouts of America and served as chancellor of the College of William and Mary. He's also the author of at least four books, including 2007's From the Shadows, 2016's A Passion for Leadership, and Duty, Memoirs of a Secretary at War from 2014, which was the occasion of his last visit to town hall. General Peter Chiarelli dedicated nearly 40 years of service to the United States. As commander of the multinational corps Iraq in 2006, Chiarelli coordinated the ac actions of all four military services and was responsible for the day-to-day -day combat operations of more than 147,000 U.S. and coalition troops. From March 2007 to August 2008, Chiarelli was the senior military assistant to Secretary of Defense Gates. During his years in the military, General Chiarelli witnessed firsthand the toll of post-traumatic stress injury on soldiers still in service and returned from combat. He turned that concern toward his founding of the organization One Mind, a nonprofit advocacy organization dedicated to accelerating the development and implementation of diagnostics, treatments, and cures, all while working to eliminate the stigma that company, accompanies mental illness. Dr. Gates's book, Exercise of Power, American Failures, Successes, and a New Path Por Forward in the post <coughs> World is the subject of tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming Peter Chiarelli and Robert M. Gates. Well, it's great to be with you all tonight. Sir, the, the title of your book could be misleading uh, to the reader who thinks they're about to read another book by a 
former longtime member of the defense establishment about the use of America's military might. Yet the focus of your book is on non-kinetic instruments of power. Why did you choose to write about non-military instruments of power? Well, Pete, I think I think that the the book really started with a question. And for me, the question was, we were on top of the world in 1993 and in a position of political, economic, military, and I would say even cultural influence and power, unprecedented uh, probably since the Roman Empire. And here we are today, almost 30 years later, and we are beset by challenges in every arena, China, Russia, all of our problems at home, Iran, North Korea, uh, we still uh, face a problem with terrorism, particularly overseas, uh, fortunately. Uh, <clears throat> and the question I was asked, I asked myself was, how did we go from the heights of January 1993 to where we are in the world today? And it seemed to me as I looked at it and thought about it, it was because we began almost immediately at the end of the Cold War to dismantle the non-military instruments of power that had been so, in, so important in winning uh, the Cold War. <clears throat> uh, you know, people don't think about it because the Cold War obviously involved the greatest arms race in the history of the world. But in terms of direct military conflict in the entirety of the Cold War, there were probably not more than 50 to 100 American soldiers or service people who were actually killed by the Soviets themselves. Uh, and, and so what became so important in the outcome of the Cold War was in fact economic instruments of power, strategic communications, uh, intelligence operations, the use of nationalism, uh, the use of our cultural strength, our scientific and cultural advantages, uh, our educational institutions, all of these played a, a role in a comprehensive competition with the Soviet Union in which they frankly were unable to compete in any significant way. And, and, and yet, with the end of the Cold War, we dismantled almost all of those instruments of power, even as we continued to strengthen our military. And, and the problem is that, you know, when, when the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem begins to look like a nail. And so I think, and I make the case in the book, that I think our Cold War pres our post-Cold War presidents, and particularly uh, Presidents Clinton and Bush, and to an extent, President Obama, uh, used the military uh, to, to almost to the exclusion of our non-military instruments of power. And, and the result was an over-militarization of our foreign policy. And we took on roles in places like Afghanistan and Iraq, where we accomplished our military objectives almost immediately, but then set for ourselves ambitions, which I argue in the book were unrealistic, but in terms of nation building, and we simply lacked the capability to do it. So, so the argument in the book really is, as you look ahead, and particularly with the long competition with China that lies in front of us, assuming that we're lucky and smart and avoid a military confrontation with China, this competition is going to take place in that non-military arena. And we need to strengthen or rebuild and recast those capabilities that were so important in the Soviet Union, in the Cold War with the Soviet Union, in order to be able to compete with China. The difference is the Chinese are much richer and frankly, much smarter than the Soviets and will be a much more formidable uh, competitor. So, you know, when I, when, I first gave, when I first gave a speech as Secretary of Defense arguing for more money for the State Department, the newspapers treated it sort of like a man bites dog story. Here's the Secretary of Defense arguing for more money for, uh, for the State Department. Uh, 
But I also make the case, and I'll, I'll end my, <clears throat> my long answer uh, with this. I also make the case in the book, it's not enough just to give more money and people to the State Department and to these other instruments. We have to restructure the way we do foreign policy. We have to restructure the, the National Security Act of 1947 has, has, is now passed its sell by, sell by time. And we need some significant reform and restructuring of our national security apparatus uh, for the 21st century. Well, you state in the book, and you state it quite definitively, that everything going forward in China will be determined by economics. Everything going forward in China will be determined by economics. How, how so and why? Well, I think... I think Maoism is as dead as a doornail. You may be able to find it in a few French and American universities, but everywhere else it's in China. It's, uh, you know, the Communist Party still exists, but basically is the framework for the exercise of authoritarian power. I don't think there are very many believers, even in China, of communism anymore. What gives legitimacy, the only thing that legitimizes the government in Beijing today and for the last several decades has been a steadily improving quality of life. And only by continuing to improve the quality of life can the Chinese government remain in power. They are scared to death of their own people and with good reason. But, and, and that's one of the challenges that they face now with the slowdown uh, in their economy and, and the challenges that they're facing from us and from other countries in terms of their trade practices. So as I write in the book, it seems only fitting that uh, a bunch of Marxist economic determinists uh, would depend, determine, determinants would be, determ would be uh, their, own, their survival depends on economics. Well, wh one of the things you talk about is, the, is China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative. How, how significant is the Belt and Road, Road Initiative? What does it mean to the United States? Well, as of last year, they had, had signed contracts uh, totaling something like $1.1 trillion and over a thousand different projects. There are a lot of problems with Belt and Road. There, there are a lot of white elephant projects. The, the biggest problem from the recipient country's standpoint is that it saddles many of them with a lot of debt. But the fact is that there are just a huge number of projects being built all over the world uh, by China. It's not just limited to the old uh, Silk Road or to the what they now call the Maritime Silk Road, uh, but they are building huge uh, projects all through Central Asia, through Southeast Asia, in the Middle East, in Africa, uh, and even even some in Europe. And, and I think that we, we don't have anything to compete with this at this point. <clears throat> I don't, you know, our greatest economic asset is our private sector. And I think where we have been very unimaginative is figuring out how government and the private sector can partner in terms of the U.S. government incentivizing American business to invest in countries, in places like Africa and in other developing countries with projects that make economic sense, that don't involve corruption, don't involve unrealistic, don't involve unrealistic debt, levels of debt, and, and, and have real value uh, for, uh, for the people that uh, are living in the area. I mean, the reality of Belt and Road projects is that in almost every single case, the country, the receiving company, is required to use a Chinese construction company or to have, the, have Chinese companies deeply involved uh, in, in the development projects. So I think we have the opportunity to be able to compete with this, but we've been singularly unimaginative in figuring out how to do it. And, and the worry, of course, in a lot of these places is that if these countries default on their debt, the Chinese will take possession of ports or other facilities that they've built. They did that and they've done that in Sri Lanka uh, they may well do it in other places. There's been pushback. The Pakistanis and the Malaysians have both forced the Chinese, pressured the Chinese into renegotiating their deals, <clears throat> downsizing them somewhat, reducing the levels of debt involved. But there are still 
these are still uh, multi-billion dollar projects going forward in these countries. A thread throughout the entire book um, is the U.S.'s inability to compete with Russia and China in the area of strategic communications. And it, 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 it asks the question, how can a nation that invented Madison Avenue, Mad Men, and four hours of Super Bowl commercials every single year <laughs> be lagging behind Russia and China in the areas of strategic communications? Well, the, the first reason is that we dismantled those capabilities uh, at the end of the Cold War and, and in the 90s. In the late 1990s, the Congress uh, uh, exterminated the, you know, uh, the U.S. Information Agency. It's now a small corner of the State Department and its boss doesn't even report directly to the Secretary of State. So here you have an institution that under President Kennedy was headed by people like Edward R. Murrow, under President Reagan was headed by people like Charlie Wick, and that had enormous influence and reach around the world uh, that, that basically disappeared. I mean, we had library, USI libraries in every major capital in the world. They sent uh, cultural groups around the world, athletic groups, uh, athletic teams around the world. So it wasn't just books and magazines, it was cultural events. They sponsored student exchanges and all kinds of things. It was very comprehensive. We had all these radios and communications. We had the Voice of America, we had Radio Free Liberty, we had uh, radio, uh, radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty. And, and those things have all been uh, diminished in the in the uh, years subsequent to the late 1990s, and and so you have China on the other hand that has this. In, uh, President Hu Jintao invested seven billion dollars in creating modern technologies, modern communications technologies, to make sure China's message got conveyed around the world. So they now have radio and television broadcasting in almost every country. And they've set up these Confucius Institutes. There are 86, there are more than 500 around the world. There are more than 80 in the United States in univers on university campuses. They're essentially there to promote Chinese foreign policy and to monitor what's being taught about China in those universities. Um, they own a number of communications facilities in Africa, networks and so on. They are able to own networks and facilities for communications in the United States, whereas no American TV network can own a counterpart in, uh, in China. So they have a very uh, robust and uh, uh, expansive strategic communications capability. And, and frankly, we're, we're, no, we're nowhere. And, and it's, a very, it's a significant disappointment. And, and it's a significant disadvantage to us uh, in terms of our ability to push back in, uh, on their messaging, not only around the world, but their messaging in this country and, and, their, own, and their interference in our internal affairs and so on. We just, we just don't, uh, we haven't been able to do that. You know, here's Russia that's interfering in our elections, interfered in Brexit interfered in, in the Brexit vote, interfered in the French election in 2017. And, and where, where is our counterpart programs breaking through the firewalls in Russia so that we can tell the Russian people about the corruption of Vladimir Putin and, and the cabal of people around him? We, we, we just are not competing in this arena and it's really important. Well, one of the things you talk about is intelligence, and, and uh, I was I was struck by this it, this quote from your book. I quote: "Intelligence presentations in the policy making process can be flawed in several ways." Now, that's that's quite an admission uh, admission for uh, a former director of the CIA. CIA, can you help us understand why you made such a statement and what can be done to guard against bad policy emanating from flawed intelligence? Well. Uh, first of all, intelligence is never going to be perfect, and uh, we found that out in the lead up to the Gulf War. I mean, to the uh, invasion of Iraq in uh, nineteen in two thousand and three. Um, I think that I think where intelligence is its strongest for the United States 
is in reporting on the capabilities of other countries around the world. We've really been very good in terms of assessing the military capabilities of countries like Russia and China, Iran, North Korea, uh, and, and the technology uh, of what they have achieved of their weapon systems and so on. I think we've done a pretty good job on their, uh, on their economics. I know the conventional wisdom is that somehow CIA missed the collapse of the Soviet Union, but in truth, um, CIA began reporting on a failing Soviet economy in the late 1970s. And I was in the Oval Office in 1985 when President Reagan was briefed by a CIA analyst and told the Soviet Union could not survive. So the notion that we were kind of surprised by it, I think is wrong. So on those kinds of capabilities, economic and, and military and scientific and technological, I think our, our intelligence is very, very strong. Where we get it, where we err and where our record is not very good is in forecasting political intentions. We failed to catch, uh, we, we failed to predict the overthrow of the Shah uh, of Iran in 1979. Um, but you know, I, I think part of the problem is in the way we present it. In, on these political issues, we, we pretend that we can read the future or the intentions of other leaders when in fact they themselves may not have even uh, uh, made up their minds and don't know what they're going to do. So I think part of the problem is that intelligence is too assertive in terms of predicting the future and in terms of predicting the political intentions uh, of other leaders. And I think that's where we get it wrong. And I also think sometimes when our evidence is not as strong as it could be, uh, U.S. intelligence, um, conveys a greater degree of confidence in their information than is warranted by the evidence. And I think the very best example of this was um, in the lead up to the war when uh, CIA Director George Tenet on the question of the presence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq told President Bush, it's a slam dunk. That's the kind of that's that that's the kind of error that I have in mind and that I'm writing about in the book. Well, it, also in the book, it, you you make a, a fairly startling statement when you say, "I believe the power of America's ideology and its p appeal as a political and economic model has diminished." Would you comment on that? Sure, I think I think first of all that the economic crisis in uh, 2008-2009 uh, around the world considerably discredited the American economic model and the notion that American capitalism was uh, something that should be emulated by other countries. Uh, similarly, I think our political paralysis, you know, our polarization has been with us since the since the founding of the Republic. And I mean, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, the names they called each other would fit right into today's political climate. But what's relatively new is our paralysis, our, our political paralysis, our inability at the federal level to solve or address any of the significant questions or problems that the nation faces, whether it's education or immigration or infrastructure or race or, or anything else. And, and it's that paralysis that other countries look at and say, do we really want to be like that? And then when you see the problems we've had in dealing with the coronavirus compared to places like Germany, as an example, people will say, well, maybe these guys really don't know how to do this very well anymore. So I think, I think that our inability economically and politically to oh, uh, address our problems uh, as, shall we say, been noticed by other countries. And I think unlike in earlier times, they're questioning whether this is a model they want to follow. And, and the Chinese are pushing very hard. And they're, it's not ideological on the Chinese part. They're basically saying, look at us. Look at the infrastructure we've built. Look at our economic success. We've brought hundreds of millions of people out of poverty over the past 30 or 40 years. And you ought to look at the Chinese model as the way you ought to organize your country. Um, and, and, and that has some appeal, especially to leaders who have a certain authoritarian bent. 
you see any way forward for us? Well, of course, there's a way forward. It just requires our politicians to decide that they're going to be more interested in addressing the problems facing the country and trying to move the nation forward than it is holding on to power or uh, getting reelected. Uh, people have, I think, for some time put getting reelected as a higher priority than doing the right thing by the country. Uh, and I've watched this under multiple presidents and um, it's, it's been a continuing concern for me and people used to be willing to take political risks to do the right thing for the country. And I don't see so much of that anymore. I, I'd remind our audience that we're gonna to go to questions here in, in, after probably this, this next question. So please, if you have one, uh, submit it and we'll make sure we get to it uh, with Secretary Gates. In, in your last chapter, which is entitled Lessons Learned, you write uh, Congress's committee structure in both the House in both houses assures that members look at each component of the national security enterprise in isolation. You've got the Armed Services for Defense, you have Foreign Affairs for State, the Intelligence Committees for CIA, and other agencies. Your your prescription is a national security committee. Could, could you explain that? Sure. I mean, ideally, you'd reform the committee structure of Congress, but uh, I know how how difficult that is, and it's probably impossible at this point because everybody loves being a chairman uh, of a committee. But you do need you do need an overarching committee or group of people in the Congress who can look at all of the elements of American power from the same kind of vantage point that the president has so that they can integrate the military, the economic, the, the diplomacy, the intelligence all at the same time, just as the president has to do. And so that's why I, I call for the establishment of these national security committees in the House and the Senate that would contain a couple of representatives from each of the key committees, appropriations, defense, armed services, foreign affairs, and so on. And they would be, you know, a modest size. I mean, they would be more on the order of 20 or 24 people instead of the 60 some that sit on the House Armed Services Committee. And, and the kind of briefings they would get would have the same kind of integrated look at American power and how they work together and re can reinforce one another if done properly, um, that in the best of circumstances, the president sees. But right now, everybody just looks through their own little window uh, through and, and in effect, to mix my metaphors, uh, has a kind of a tunnel vision uh, that focuses only on what, what they are uh, specifically assigned to do. Okay, now I'm, I'm going to go to questions uh, from our audience. And our first question is from Sherry, uh, who asks, any thoughts on the uproar and legal threats against Bolton's book? Uh, you, you beat them to the finish line, but uh, <laughs> as you well know, there are folks that are saying that uh, it should not be published. Do you have any thoughts on the uproar or legal threats to, to, to John Bolton's book? Well, I'm, I actually am in a pretty good position to address those issues since I've had four books published and I have had all four uh, go through the government approval process. Uh, the, first, uh, the first one was just a CIA process. Uh, the book on duty uh, was actually reviewed by the National Security Council, the uh, Department of Defense and CIA. Uh, my leadership book was reviewed by CIA and the Defense Department, and, and my current book, Exercise of Power, was reviewed by the Defense Department. In my case, I have to say I have had no complaint with that process. Now, maybe it was because I've been around long enough and have sensitive, am sensitive enough to um, things like intelligence sources and methods and uh, the technology of weapon systems and so on that I tend not to write about those things. I, uh, and so I have had no difficulty uh, in getting my uh, previous, in, uh, all four of my books approved. I, I have to say it's hard for me not to believe uh, that there is a, um, uh, a political agenda 
involved in the delays associated with uh, John Bolton's book. Uh, I think the president's assertion that every conversation he has is classified, um, I think is, is uh, quite a reach. Um, and my guess is that, that the holdup with the book has more to do with political uh, sensitivity than anything having to do with national security issues, especially at this point, since what I've read is that Bolt's been through about a four month uh, review process uh, in which he's tried to accommodate a lot of the concerns. Zhang asks, you are critical of our current political system, stating that politicians are more interested in getting reelected than doing the right thing for the country. What changes can be made to rectify this? You know, one thing that I that I actually one reform that I opposed for a long time, uh, but have begun to change my mind about, is term limits. Part of the problem is that the Congress today has way too many members who have never done anything except be a member of Congress. Um, and, you know, the idea, this is one thing where I think the, one of the few places where the founders didn't anticipate a problem. They had a really, really insightful uh, view of America, of, of human nature and tried to design a system of government to take that into account. But I think what they didn't count on was that in their case, they were almost all already successful farmers or businessmen or lawyers uh, or whatever. And the idea was you would serve in Congress, you had, would be successful in a career, then you as a public service would go serve in Congress for a period of time and then you'd go home. And, and almost all of them wrote in, in terms of the burden of public service. What's happened is we have so many members of Congress who have never known any other profession other than being a member of Congress and their psyche is wrapped up in it, the deference, the staff, um, and, and so on. And, and the idea of not being in Congress, I think is, is uh, uh, horrifying to them and partly because they don't have anything else that they're able to do. And what's more, when they do leave, when they're defeated or they uh, finally retire or whatever, they don't go back to Peoria or to um, Seattle. They, they stay in Washington on K Street as lobbyists. We had, we had, in the 2014 election, we had two United States senators, both Republicans, one from Indiana and one from Kansas, who didn't even have a residence in the state they purported to represent in Washington. So. I think, I think maybe term limits where everybody knows you're only going to be able to serve for six years or eight years in the House or uh, two terms, 12 years in the Senate, something like that, that lets them know, you know, this is not a lot, that you're not a federal judge. You're not going to get a lifetime job here. And the problem is, the problem I used to say, well, we have term limits. They're called elections. But the reality is today, the way that because of gerrymandering and, and, and political fixing and so on, there are only about 50 congressional races in the country that year in and year out are actually competitive. They've organized it in such a way that, that most districts are safe for most members of Congress. And they actually cooperate. They'll, they'll carve those districts up. So you're guaranteed a Republican seat here and we're guaranteed a Democratic seat here. And, and uh, <clears throat> so I think I, I've become more and more of an advocate of, uh, of term limits. Chris asks, would inter interfering with other countries' elections or politics actually provide legitimacy to countries such as Russia? Reciprocity doing the same. I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Um, I think that, I don't think we need to, well, first of all, I think it'd be very difficult to interfere in a Russian election since it's already rigged from the start. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, just like 
Vladimir Putin's going to get his uh, referendum on whether he can essentially be president for life, uh, my guess is that you can predict the outcome of that election um, right now. Um, similar to the outcomes of the deliberations of the National Party Congress in, uh, in China. So I think, uh, I think what is important for us in our strategic communications and frankly in our intelligence operations is basically to reveal to the people of these countries the truth about their leadership and about their condition. This is what we did with the respect to the Soviet Union in, uh, during the Cold War. We basically just told them the truth about what the Soviet Union was up to in Eastern Europe and, and in Central Asia and in Afghanistan and various other places. Uh, I, think, I think if we're going to use our technical and uh, intelligence and other capabilities to uh, communicate information into other countries despite the wishes of their leaders, uh, sticking to the truth that always served us pretty well in the in the Cold War, telling the Iranian people about the corruption of the Ayatollah and the people around him and the Revolutionary Guard and so on. These are very powerful messages because, you know, and this was, you know, I write in the book about our overly ambitious uh, agendas in both Iraq and Afghanistan and trying to change those societies. Societies, change in societies has to come from within. And so if we can give the people of Iran and people of uh, China and people of Russia information about the reality of their leaders, um, they, they will at some point um, take charge of their own future. Uh, Sherry asks, how much of the lead up to the war in Iraq was due to faulty intelligence versus definite intention to invade irregardless of intelligence? Well, I, I make the point in the book that I think um, this is a case where, where bad intelligence really did fuel um, the policy decisions. You know, Re UN Resolution 1441 that was passed in uh, the fall of 2002 and that essentially laid down an ultimatum to Saddam Hussein about re revealing what was going on with his weapons of mass destruction and so on. The interesting thing is that the way Resolution 1441 got passed, including with the support of China and Russia, was that almost every intelligence service in the world believed that Saddam either was building weapons of mass destruction or wanted to. And, and part of the reason was he wanted people to believe that. He wanted his own people to believe it so they'd think he was more powerful than he was. He also wanted his neighbors to know it, like the Iranians. So you had a situation in which the UN acted based on intelligence that was in, shared in common around the world about the threat of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And, uh, and I think that was the basis of the decision to, to go into, uh, to go into uh, Iraq. Now, as the book points out, thinking about and planning for a possible attack in Iraq began very soon after the invasion, after we went into Afghanistan. But whether there would have actually been an, an invasion of Iraq, if the intelligence had been, had, had argued otherwise, that had argued or said there was no evidence of weapons of mass destruction, I, I think there's a reasonable chance there would have been no invasion under those circumstances. One of the other points that I make in the book is that there actually were probably two or three okay opportunities before the invasion to have taken an action short of invasion that would have assured that there were no weapons of mass destruction and thereby obviated the need for the invasion. A major one was uh, in, in December of 1998, President Clinton launched a major, um, the, Saddam threw out all the inspectors and refused to allow them back in. The US and the United Kingdom together launched four days of major military strikes against targets in Iraq and then stop. 
but they didn't insist that Saddam allow the inspectors back in. So for all practical purposes, the UN authorized inspection process to assure there were no weapons of mass destruction came to an end in December 1998. Had Clinton continued the military attacks until Saddam or his generals agreed to allow the inspectors back in and made that a condition of stopping the attacks on the Iraqi military, it might have removed the, the need for any invasion in the first place. That was also an alternative that was available to George W. Bush. He could have made the same kind of threat to the Iraqis. Either you let the inspectors back in or we will bomb your military uh, until you do. So there were, I think, a couple of opportunities in which um, an, an invasion might have been avoided um, by the application, the sustained application of air power uh, much earlier. Here's a question from Fred that you and I have talked about a lot. How, how would you rank climate change and biodiversity loss as a security threat versus political conflict threat with China, Russia, or other countries? The problem with climate change in a political environment is it's long term. There's, there's not, I mean, I know a lot of people will argue that the, the threat is upon us right now. And, and I agree in many instances, that's the case. But from a national security standpoint, it's, it's not, it does not have the immediacy of the other problems that we've been talking about. The, but I think it does have significant longer term national, I think climate change has significant longer term um, national security consequences. For one thing, particularly as you see the desertification in Africa increase uh, and you see uh, climate change and, and whether it's huge floods during the monsoon season in South Asia, whether it's uh, drought in uh, Africa or in parts of Asia, wherever you have people in great distress and the movement of migrants and the ineffectiveness of government to deal with those consequences, you're going to have instability and that instability and seedbed for terrorism uh, will grow. And so as, as more and more people in the world uh, suffer deprivation because of climate change or massive refugee flows, the political consequences of that are real and will not be contained just to the location where they're taking place. The other, the other consequence for the American military is uh, we have a lot of military facilities right on the coast and already uh, the huge naval facility, U.S. naval facility in Norfolk is dealing with the rising uh, seas and they're talking about multi-billion dollar projects on how you prevent those huge shipyards and the Navy base uh, from being subjected to um, uh, more uh, encroaching uh, ocean waters. Same thing in Mayport, Florida. So, so there, there are potentially many billions of dollars of um, facilities changes that are going to have to be made by the U.S. military because of climate change down the road. Here's here's a question from Joan. Um, do we need international observers for our November election? <laughs> Maybe we should get President Carter's Carter Center to, uh, to observe. They, they observe elections all over the world. No, I think the problem that we have in the United, I mean, not the problem, but actually one of the safeguards for the United States is that our electoral system is so um, localized and dispersed. I mean, when you're talking about 20,000 or many thousands of different polling places and, and uh, counties and, and so on. Um, I think it's very difficult to, to actually uh, have an um, impact the voting. Now, I believe that the Russians are very aggressive and to a certain extent, the Chinese as well 
in trying to exploit our differences, certainly trying to exploit the already bad racial problems that we have. I think that they are uh, eager to figure out ways to divide us as much as they can, to discredit one or another candidate, um, and and uh, to create um, uncertainty about the security of the vote and so on. But I think I think when push comes to shove, actually shaping or influencing the outcome of the election. Um, the country's just so large, I think that's a very difficult thing to do, but there's no doubt in my mind uh, that they will continue their efforts to um, play on our divisions and try and exacerbate them and turn us against one another. And, and also as they, as, uh, uh, to, tr to try and tilt things one way or another. But I think, I, as I say, I think their ability to do that is pretty limited. Yeah, I never thought I'd have to ask you that question, but <laughs> uh, Dr. Kelly Callahan. Actually, uh, I, I actually I would just add, you know, it's one of the reasons why I'm glad Washington has mail-in voting. Uh, I happen to think that it's probably as secure an approach as we can have. You, it's pretty hard to hack the post office, and uh, but beyond that. Uh, I, I think it makes voting more accessible for more people. Yeah, I would agree. Um, Dr. Kelly Callahan asks along these same lines, do you think the democratic experiment is ultimately unrecoverable at this point, given the inability to eliminate money from politics? No, I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's irrecoverable. Um, you know, I remember when we were, um, Age does provide you certain benefits. I remember uh, I lived through the late 1960s, and we thought the country was going to come apart. We had the assassination of Martin Luther King. We had the assassination of Robert Kennedy. We had the riots at the Chicago Convention. Uh, we had a gigantic gener generation gap in the country. We were terribly divided. And then you threw Vietnam on top of all of that. And so we were in trouble in the late 19 in the late 1960s. In the late 1970s, um, it seemed that the Soviet Union was on the ascendancy. Uh, we had double digit, uh, literally 17, 18, 19% interest rates uh, and, um, and, and mortgages were at 16, 17% uh, interest. Uh, inflation was almost the same uh, and uh, we had hostages in Iran. We had the oil embargo. There were just, there were a lot of problems. We appeared weak that the United States was sort of declining. So I think my, my attitude would be we're, we are going through a rough patch. There's no question about it in a lot of different ways in our politics, in our relations with each other and particularly race relations. Um, but there's no, also no doubt in my mind that any other country in the world would be seriously mistaken to underestimate our resilience and our ability to figure out how to come back out of, out of uh, a set of problems. Uh, I, I think we will. I think, it, I think it really depends on our leadership. And it's not just the president. It's, it's members of Congress. It's business leaders. It's religious leaders. It's community leaders. I think one of the things that the COVID virus has demonstrated for us is one of the strengths of our federal system is where, where you may believe that the federal government has not responded very effectively. There are a lot of state governments and a lot of local communities that have. And, and uh, so that kind of gives me hope. Well said. Now, Cody wanted to, first of all, thank you for your service, Dr. Gates. But he said, he asked a question last year, many feared we were in a game of chicken with Iran with an inevitable firefight given the nature of our current counterinsurgency wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Are we beyond the point of fighting a hot, hard war that would require a joint strike fighter, the F-35? Is a greater threat to America our domestic unrest 
political paralysis or losing the war of ideas you described today, uh, our loss of credibility? Well, I often, I often get asked the question, what do you see as the greatest threat to the national security of the United States? And my response consistently is that the greatest threat to the national security of the United States is found within the two square miles that encompass the White House and the, and the Capitol building. Because if we can't figure out a way to break out of our paralysis, if we can't find a way to find bipartisan solutions to our problems, if we can't remember that compromise is the only thing that makes this country work, the Constitution itself is a bundle of big compromises, if we can't figure out these domestic problems, there is no foreign threat to me that is as big a threat to our future as that paralysis in Washington. Uh, I, I don't, you know, I think that the insurgencies and what, what we're doing in Iraq and Afghanistan will not create a problem for us uh, with Iran. I think Iran's own behavior uh, could be a problem and particularly if they get too aggressive with respect to our Navy in the Persian Gulf, but but I, as I said, I think our our biggest threat uh, is is found within those two square miles. Randolph asks again a, a topic that you and I have talked about a lot. Would would you support universal service, given the current separation of the military and civil society, and influence of the military industrial complex? I'm actually a, a, a strong supporter of mandatory national service, but by far not limited to the military. You know, um, if you go to some of the state parks and places around Washington here, you see some of the work that has been done, that was done back in the 30s by the Civilian Conservation Corps. And my view is, you know, we, we hear all the time about uh, people's assertion of their rights as a citizen. What I don't ever hear is anybody talking about our obligations as a citizen. So I think the notion that everyone between the ages of 18 and 28 or whatever would have to spend a year or two in service to the nation has a great deal of appeal, and particularly in terms of making clear, as the saying goes, that freedom isn't free. But I would not, I would br vastly broaden what that national service uh, might entail. It would, and it, for, as far as I'm concerned, it would involve uh, work in the national parks and restoring trails and to undertaking a lot of the maintenance that's so overdue in our national parks. It would involve tutoring in rural areas or or in uh, in urban settings, it would it could involve it could involve working in a hospital um, as an aide. It, it could involve tutoring. Uh, there are there is a host of activities that are that serve the community and the nation, including military service, that I would include in the in the definition of military in the definition of national service. Uh, but I think it's, I think it's really critically important. Uh, and I think it would, it would, um, it would give a renewed sense of civic responsibility to young people that I think uh, has, has faded. Well, I, I guess this is our final question because I, I'm down to the last one, but the, uh, the 25th, this is from, David, David asked, uh, the 25th Amendment appears to be a failure if its intent was to rid us of incompetent POTUSes. Your thoughts? Well, I don't think the 25th Amendment was ever intended to, get, to rid us of incompetent presidents. It was intended to uh, provide a path forward for uh, presidents who were uh, for the country and for presidents who were incapacitated or unable to perform the, the duties of the, uh, of the office and their provisions on how that would happen. Um, if, if, um, well, I'll just leave it there. <laughs>
Yes. Uh, and I guess we'll leave it with that. That uh, I think we've gone through our whole set of questions. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I guess I'll end and I get to ask the final question because it, in, in the prologue to your book, you do say there have been successes in the international arena during the past quarter century. But the overall trend for us in the global arena has been negative, despite our braggadocio. To deal with the diverse challenges American faces, America must lead. But to lead, to achieve its purposes and goals, it must apply all the instruments of power with greater wisdom. We must use the American symphony of power to ensure that authoritarianism, twice defeated in the 20th century, does not prevail in the 21st. That to me is an, a, a, you know, an amazing statement. And, and I know when you talk of the symphony of power, that's what your book discusses. Could you kind of leave us with talking a little bit about that symphony of power so our audience understands all the pieces that you think make up that symphony? Sure, I, I think that, uh, and the reason I use the, the term symphony is that all of the different instruments have to be coordinated, orchestrated, if you will, to work together and integrated. And so there are two pieces to the puzzle. The first is how do you recreate or strengthen uh, the range of instruments, whether they're economic or strategic communications or education or science and technology or nationalism uh, or uh, intelligence uh, and so on. And how do you, how do you coordinate? And so the first is how do you develop those capabilities so that they are robust enough to be effective? And then the second problem is how do you structure the government in a way that you can make them all work in harmony, that you can bring them together uh, in, in, in a way that uh, is successful uh, in achieving American objectives. And my, one of my examples, uh, one of the success stories that I write about in the book uh, was President Bush's uh, initiative to deal with HIV AIDS in Africa. This was a program that cost billions and billions of dollars, had broad bipartisan support, but the way that it actually worked was that he identified a, signal coordin a sig single coordinator in the State Department and empowered that person to coordinate the programs of all of the different agencies that had a piece of that pie so that all of the different elements of the American government that had a role in dealing with HIV AIDS were brought together to work together in harmony and save millions of lives in Africa and in a way that had huge bipartisan support uh, despite uh, a very great cost. And this at a time when President Bush, shall we say, was not one of the most popular presidents we've ever had. So this is an example of how how you can create the circumstances in which you can have a successful policy that involves a variety of different instruments, uh, properly coordinated, or if you will, properly orchestrated. And this is, what, this is what I've observed in my time in government, is that when people speak of a whole of government effort, it's, it's rhetoric. It's very difficult under the current structures to have a fully integrated national effort uh, to deal with a, with, a, with a specific problem. But PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Program uh, for AIDS, uh, is an example of where that could be made to work and, and, and how it did work. So that gives me hope we can actually figure out a way to do all of this. All that's required is, uh, is the leadership, and frankly, the skills uh, to bring it all together. I, I, I said that was going to be the last question, but I've got to ask one more because throughout your book, uh, you make the point that you criticize successive <laughs> administrations' failure to publicize large-scale U.S. Human humanitarian assistance. Why is that? 
why is it that we failed to do that? Well, it goes back to my broader point about strategic communications. And, and, and I, I say at one point in the book, we need less monastic order and more Madison Avenue. I mean, who knew in the late 90s, in 1999, in the middle of the North Korean famine, the United States of America gave more food assistance to North Korea than the entire rest of the world put together and three times as much as China. Who knew in the early 2000s when an earthquake hit the town of Bam in Iran? Here is, here is our, one of our worst enemies in the world, Iran. And who flies in military aircraft loaded with medical supplies and other relief supplies? And the, and the Iranian government wouldn't, said they wouldn't let us broadcast it. Well, baloney. Why, why do we need their permission to say that we're actually helping them? Obviously, they didn't want to acknowledge that the United States was helping them out of a jam, but that didn't mean we shouldn't do it. So we've done these amazing things around the world, and nobody knows. Well, Fred Kuntz kind of sums this whole thing up uh, with his final comment, which is thank you. And I know I speak for the 200 folks that uh, are on here right now in thanking you for uh, a real stimulating evening tonight. Uh, thanks for answering uh, all our questions. Uh, and, 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 and thanks for your service to our country. Well, thank you, Pete, our, and uh, thanks, thanks to everybody. I'm really pleased to have been able to participate. It's great to be back uh, uh, with the Seattle Town Hall, even if it's remote. And on behalf of Town Hall, I just want to thank everybody for tuning in this evening. And thank you again to Secretary Gates and General Torelli for being here this evening. Uh, if you enjoyed this event, you can find many more like it on our website, townhallseattle.org. And we hope that you'll consider making a donation to Town Hall Seattle as your support will allow us to continue to provide events just like the one this evening. If you're interested in purchasing a copy of Sir Secretary Gates's book, Exercise of Power, American Failures, Successes, and a New Path Forward in the Post-Cold War World, please use the link on this live stream page to purchase through our friends at Elliott Bay Book Company. And finally, thank you again for being here this evening. We hope you have a good night.